um, we're back with the modeling um, session and we start with uh, Ella Gavni from DLR. Uh, please, Ella, go ahead with your presentation. Okay, yeah, um, thanks for inviting me. Um, I think I was invi invited to like bring the M to the meeting, so talk about CCMI and how it needs CCI, maybe. Um, and I first want to acknowledge my co-authors. Um, I'm most, mostly going to talk about a study here that we did jointly with my co-workers Simone Dietmüller and Roland Eichinger. And we were also happy to have um, Will Ball um, in the boat on this. Okay, so let me start very broadly um, with asking the question, wh why are we actually using models, right? I mean, as Wolfgang said earlier, data is always better. Um, but I think it's obvious that there are many reasons why we use model. And, I think three like broad areas of why we are doing that. The very obvious one is predicting, right? We can't say much about the future if we don't use a model of, of some sort. Um, but then we can also do the, the attribution. Um, so an example of that is shown here from the, the DOMS et al. Um, study from a few years back, where we can run our chemistry climate model. So that's from the last round of the big intercomparison of chemistry climate models, um, CCMI1. And the red lines here show basically the, the projections if we include all the four things we know of and kind of the best guess going into the future. And then we, we can do simulations where we simply tell the model, well, let's say we keep greenhouse gases fixed at 1960. Let's pretend there would be no climate change, for example, and see how ozone develops, which would be the green line, so the fixed greenhouse gas simulations. So then we know what are the impacts of basically only the ODSs in this case on um, ozone. Or we can do it the other way around. We can keep the ODSs fixed and, and then basically look at the impact of greenhouse gases or climate change, so to say, when ozone and we see the yeah, the kind of gradual increase in stratospheric ozone or total column ozone here, um, as as we know very well now that it's supposed to happen due to the stratospheric cooling. And as again Wolfgang has um, nicely pointed out in his study already. But then I'd argue there's the third uh, large area of why we're using model, and that is understanding. So we want to understand the processes that are driving whatever we're interested in here, here the ozone changes. Um, and so, of course, well, first of all, we can argue if the model is able to reproduce um, the, the observations, that maybe means that we included the right processes. That doesn't necessarily mean we understand them, actually, interestingly. Um, and for understanding, we maybe sometimes even want to use simpler models. So we just get down to an individual process and then maybe it's not even um, or the, the model might not reproduce the, um, the observation anymore, but we can kind of understand maybe an individual process. But mostly here it's going to be about the, the complex model, the chemistry climate models, um, where we do, of course, aim to reproduce the observations and where basically the, the prerequisite um, for doing the attribution and the prediction is that we can evaluate our models and that we know that they are reproducing the past. And of course, there's some uh, potential well, maybe problems or prerequisites um, to do the evaluation. First of all, we need the availability of the data and, and data of good quality. So that's what most of or many of you who are here are concerned with and are doing really great work. So we, we actually do have those long term data sets that we can use for evaluating the models. But then there's the second point that I mostly want to talk about today, and that is that we do have the interannual variability or even climate variability um, that, of course, leads to a certain variability in our time series, as in particular for the northern hemisphere, we can see very nicely here, right? It depends maybe on, on a particular year, whether there was a sudden warming or not, um, how, the, how ozone looks in this particular year. And of course, then it gets um, difficult to um, evaluate trends in particular when you go for for shorter periods and as was also pointed out nicely in a few talks we are now very interested in looking at at ozone trends in this recent past period so basically in this period where we kind of expect the recovery of ozone to set in and as, as is also kind of already seen from this figure very nicely we do have the smooth um, estimate from the models because we can kind of average a lot of models together so we can kind of take out this internal variability but obviously we can't do that for the observations but there we always have kind of this one representation of um, yeah of whatever happened in, in the real world um, and yeah that that's basically going to be a little bit of my focus here, or mostly my focus here in this talk um, about how we can still um, compare 
models and observations and how we can kind of um, make an, an, an conclusion on whether there's agreement or disagreement. Okay, um, so let me start um, with this figure of, of uh, ozone trends um, in the recent period, which is based on the ozone CCI data set. So this is mostly actually a proof that you've done a really good job in providing data very um, yeah, easily for data users. So even me as kind of a satellite data dummy, maybe I was able to, to get the data and make this plot very quickly. Um, and that's, that's really fantastic. Um, but of course, um, there are much more detailed studies on, on those trends. Uh, one particular one that got a lot of attention is the study by Will Ball, who has, um, yeah, ha has analyzed the trends in ozone over the recent past um, from different data products as well. And one particular point that got a lot of attention is, of course, this negative trend in the lower stratosphere. So in the upper stratosphere, we have the positive trend, as we expect from ozone recovery. Um, but in the lower stratosphere, um, he finds, and in my simple analysis, I find that as well, this persistent negative trend extending well into the mid-latitudes, which is somewhat unexpected. And um, to quantify this somewhat unexpected will, again, be the, the focus of my talk today. Um, so I won't talk much about the different of those data sets or the uncertainty in, in the data products, because the experts for that are, are all of you, basically. But they're going to talk about the comparison to the um, to the models. So if we take um, model simulations for the same period and we calculate the ozone trend in the same manner than in the observations, and then we take the mean over all the model simulations we have. So this is actually 31 different model simulations from the CCMI data set. We do get um, this picture here. So what we have is we do also have the decline in ozone and topics in the lower stratosphere. We do also have the increase in the upper stratosphere, which is which is good. Um, but then in the mid-latitudes, that's kind of the, the puzzle piece that a lot of people have been talking about. We do have this positive trends in, in the models. Um, now we know in this short time period, in particular in the lower stratosphere, we have a lot of variability. So let's add the significance here. Um, and so we see, okay, apparently there's basically not much significant in the models in the lower stratosphere. Um, and well, that is because there's a lot of variability and many people have argued, and that is of course true that in this short period, there's so much variability that maybe, you know, you can't um, really conclude on observations and trend being, be, being in disagreement, but rather it's just all natural variability that kind of leads to any sort of, of pattern here. And I hope my battery holds, I should get my cable, sorry, <laughs> for the disruption. Um, and that point is kind of, um, again, made if we look at trends in all the individual model simulations. So that now on the left hand side, you're not supposed to, um, and to, to really look at all the individual figures, but that's just, again, illustrating that if you look at an individual model simulation, you kind of get all sorts of pattern because you do have a lot of variability. And so the observations kind of might be only just one representation of the possible trends that you can get over this period. And now we could say, okay, that's it. There's a lot of variability. Um, let's just wait for another 20 years and then we'll find out whether that hypothesis was true or not. But that would be a bit boring and maybe also not very wise. So um, we decided let's see if we can kind of tackle out a little bit more on this comparison and do more or less kind of an estimate of, of the likelihood of um, the observational trends being one representation of the trend distribution from the models in a way. Okay, so oh no, I should go back and point out that now we're gonna mostly focus on the one hand on the tropics. So that's this red box here on the right hand side to the north south and the lower stratosphere, so between 100 and 30 hectopascal. And then we're going to focus on the mid latitudes between 30 degrees north and down to 150 hectopascal here. And again, up to 30 hectopascal. And so we use two, those two boxes, calculate the kind of partial, um, partial column. And now we can again look at the from all the individual model simulations. Um, and we see again there, there's a lot of uh, variability between the different models and the, the 
point to focus on here the right hand side. So if we compile all the models together, the distribution of model trends, the, the red bar here. Yeah, for the topics, the red, we kind of see okay, the observational trend, which is the small dot here, is, is, is somewhere within the distribution of the bottles. Um, while for the mid latitudes, we see this is not really the case, right? There we do have mostly we do get a positive trend in the models, and this trend in observations is kind of um, yeah outside um, or would, would be an outlier in this distribution in a way. Now again, this is for this one particular period, and as we know, variability plays a large role here. We thought let's vary this period a little bit and see what what happens to the trend. And we first did that um, to, for the observations. Um, so this is all the, the data set by, by Will Ball, by the way. I think I haven't said that. Okay, and so we used this observed um, data set and calculated just kind of simple linear trends for different periods. So we varied the start um, year from 95 to 2001, and then we varied the end year from 2013 to 2019. So those trends are of, of different lengths, right? If you go along of those lines, um, and they, they start differently and end differently and so on. And the same again now for the tropics and for the mid-latitudes. And what we found is that the trends really are rather consistently negative, both in the tropics and in the mid-latitudes, even though you do vary the period quite a bit here. There are just some differences in particular in the mid-latitudes, right, where we have this, this chunk here where we have rather negative trends. And that might partially be due, to, for example, to, to the ENSO event, which happens in the, happened in the, the late 90s. Um, so obviously, you do see some, some sources of natural variability here. But nevertheless, the important message is that the trend appears to be very robust across those different, um, those different periods. OK, now let's see what the models do. And for that, we kind of took a bit of an, uh, I don't know if advanced, but yeah, some some approach to quantify that a little bit better, and we kind of um, wanted to calculate really the probability distribution function of the trend for the models. So what we did, we had those 31 model simulations, right? Each of them provided us one trend value with a standard deviation, just from the standard deviation from the linear fit. And so from those, we basically randomly drew a model and then randomly drew a trend value based on this mean trend plus standard deviation. And we did this 5,000 times, and so with that, we, we kind of created this probability distribution um, of the, the modeled trends. And again, we did this for, for each of those periods here. Um, and what's shown here now as a starter is just kind of the most likely value of this distribution for each period. And so what we see is that in the tropics, we do also have, as expected, the, the negative trend, the lower stratosphere, almost almost all the periods at least, um, rather consistently. And in the mid latitudes, on the other hand, we do also have consistently those positive trends in all the periods we looked at. Now we can also look basically at the at the width of the standard deviation, so at the width of the distribution, so at the standard deviation of the distribution, which is so shown in the lower panel. So that's uh, yeah, probably not um, not very surprisingly, we do obviously have lower standard deviations if we go to periods, right? That's that's what you expect. That variability gets a little bit less important the longer the period is, and therefore this distribution of trends will become a little bit a little bit smaller. Okay, and now the big question is how does the observed trend fit into those um, distributions? Here? And um, so to, to, to kind of estimate that, we did the following. So this, again, a sketch here, we have this red line, which would represent the observed, um, the observed value for, for the trend. And now we ask basically how, how many, um, well, based on this di distribution, how much percentage of trends would be more extreme? So in other words, we kind of quantify this, this inner um, kind of in a, um, in a percentile more or less of um, of trends of the distribution that is that is less extreme and that would be our x here right and on on the on the borders we do have the more extreme values and so if our x for example is 90 percent that means that only 10 percent of the modeled trends 
are more extreme than our um, than our observed trend. And that's kind of a way of quantifying whether it is likely that the observed trend is kind of one realization given the model distribution. Okay, and now we do this procedure again for all the different periods that we have chosen. And that is what is shown in the panels here. So again, the tropics over here. So here we have kind of those values between like say 30 and, and, and 40, 50 maybe. So that means you have to take um, basically 100 minus those values that between about 20, like around 50 or 40 percent of the model trends are actually more extreme than the observed trend. And so if, if, if that is the case, that means that um, the trend, the observed trend actually lies well within the um, within the model distribution, right? Like if, if there would be 100% um, 100 more extreme, that would mean that the observed trend basically lies right in the middle of the, of the distribution. Okay, so for the tropics, we can conclude from this kind of statistical analysis that um, the observed trend is a likely representation of whatever we see in the models. But then if we look into the mid-latitudes, we do have values here that are much higher. Um, so if we translate that, that means that um, between about 30 and maybe even 10% of the model trends are more extreme than the observed trends. So that means that um, really the, the observed trend in the mid latitudes would be an extreme value um, given the modeled trend distribution. Okay, so with this procedure, we maybe could quantify a little bit better whether um, those trends we see in the observations are, are expected or not. And as I said, in the tropics, um, we see the observed trend lies rather well within the model trend distribution, so kind of all is good there. But in the mid latitudes, this um, observed ozone trend is really more of an extreme value in the model trend distribution. And, and what does this mean now? Of course, that doesn't mean that the observed value is wrong. It just means that the, um, the trend distribution in the models should be, could be wrong, right? Basically, you can break it down to different reasons what, what can happen here. I mean, one reason which we should always check is whether the observed time evolution maybe really just was rather extreme. So we had this ENSO event, for example, and all sort of other natural variability going on. So it could be that just for some reason, things added up in a way that in particular in the mid latitudes, we have kind of this extreme um, time evolution that led to this extreme value in the trends. But then of course, the other point could be, as I said, that the trend distribution of the models is actually not correct. And Again, you can kind of um, have two different things that happen here. Either the trend, the trend distribution could actually be narrow. So that means, as kind of depicted here, that the observed trend might appear more extreme than it actually was. Um, and the reason for that could be that natural variability might be underrepresented um, in the models. So this is all just hypothesis to put out now, right? Um, but then, of course, the other possibility is that the, the mean value of this distribution is not correct. And that would mean that we do not get the false trend correctly in the models. And that's, of course, what we're really concerned with, because we really want to make sure we get the false trend correct, because that is also what, what our longer term predictions um, uh, are based on then, basically. OK, so that's basically as far as, as we can get here. But then, of course, as I said, we can also, yeah. Can you start uh, maybe uh, going towards the conclusions? Please? Um, yeah, sure. <laughs> thank you. Okay, thanks. Yeah. Um, okay, so I'm going to jump a little bit uh, um, over a few points and I, I was expecting that I wouldn't be able to say them. Um, but maybe let me make this per last point here. And that is that, again, we can use the models um, for some attribution. So looking at which were the, the forces um, of the ozone trends. Um, and um, so this is basically similar to what we've seen before. So the ozone trends for the models, the whole distributions, and we have the observed values. And now we can add in the simulations where we have the fixed greenhouse gas or the fixed ODS scenario. And um, here we, we see that the tropical ozone decrease is driven by the enhanced greenhouse gases. This is what we expect. It's the enhanced upwelling. We know very well how that works. But for the mid-latitudes, we actually see that this ozone increase seems to be driven by so this is not necessarily the enhanced downward transport, which I was kind of expecting, but this really seems to have to do with, with the recovery of ozone from, 
from ODSs, why we see that in the models. Um, and that already, let me jump to my conclusion, um, yeah, br brings me to this um, kind of summary of how far we've got here. So hopefully I could show you a little bit that um, by using basically this multi-model ensemble and using a bit more advanced techniques than, than just doing kind of a, a direct comparison, we could kind of evaluate the likelihood of the observed ozone trends to be one realization of the model evolution. And I think in particular, if we look at those kind of not that long time series, that's maybe a good, good uh, approach to, to do comparisons in general. Um, and we did find this discrepancy in the in the middle latitudes and kind of can put out maybe a few different hypotheses of, of why that could be. Of course, one which I actually haven't listed here is that maybe the, the observed um, time series just for some reason shows kind of extreme behavior. Um, but then of course, the other one is the question whether there's some going something wrong in a way in the models. So one thing that I didn't have time to show you is that um, in the in the mid latitudes, we do find that they're competing transport processes influencing the, the trends on the ozone trends, right? That's probably very expected. You have the shallow branch, you have the deep branch, you have mixing and all that kind of adds to um, to having different influences on ozone. And so a possible hypothesis could be to be tested whether a misrepresentation of transport or transport trends in the models could kind of lead to this ozone trend looking, um, uh, yeah, looking different basically in the in the observations and in the in the models. Another hypothesis, um, which I kind of just quickly hinted on now, is that we do see that this positive ozone trend is driven by the decreasing ODSs. And so a possible hypothesis, again, to be um, tested and, and, and carefully, is that either the ODS forcing or the response to it in this very recent past period could be overestimated in the models in, in some way. And a small hint to that would be that we actually also see in the upper stratosphere that the ozone increases um, seem to be a bit stronger in the models compared to the observations. But as I said, that's all to be continued and um, it will be interesting to find out which of the hypotheses are true. Um, and just at the very end, I wanted to make a short um, kind of statement or advertisement of the upcoming um, set of CCMI simulations that are going on at the moment. And I, uh, being kind of calculated at the different groups at the moment. So those are the simulations in support of the 2022 ozone assessment, which will again inc include a hindcast simulation, but extending to 2018, which I think will be very valuable for studying those trends in the recent, um, in the recent past. It will have the future projections based on the newer SSP scenarios. And I think, again, an important point is that um, emphasis was made on, on requesting multiple ensembles. So again, getting at this question of, of variability, which is very important here. Okay, with that, I, I thank you and I'm happy to take questions. Uh, thank you so much, Ella. I'm going to allow one question in the interest of time, and then perhaps you can check the chat and reply directly to the others. I think sure. the one from Paul might be an interesting one. Paul, would you like to um, ask your question, please? There's also some time in the discussion, so, you know, if there's any burning, other burning issues, but Paul, would you like to ask your question? Yeah, I, I, okay, I found my unmute button. Um, oh, Pella, okay. just, a quick, just a quick question. I mean, it sounds like you're suggesting that our understanding of chlorine and bromine chemistry might might be wrong. Is that too extreme? Yeah. Or? <laughs> no, I, I don't want to su suggest that at all, actually. Um, and, and and I don't know what, what the possible reason would be. I mean, I guess you, you, you're um, referring to the statement that the, the response to the ODS kind of might be overestimated or something. I mean, I, right. I don't know about the about the forcing, right? How much it might actually, how, how correct it is over the just kind of last year. So this is also based on the ref D2 simulation, so the future simulation. So if we go into like 20, I don't know, 16 and later, this is all scenario based. So that could be a small part of it. Um, but yeah, I, I'm, I, I don't know. I, I don't think that the chemistry is, is wrong. I personally, even though I'm, I'm not a chemist, um, as I said, that's just a possible hypothesis here. Thanks. Thank you. 
So, Ella, if you could, uh, there are a few more questions in the chat. If you could answer them, I'd like now to ask uh, Aunt Jane to share her presentation so we can progress with the session. Right. Let's see. Can you see my screen? Yes. Yeah. Yes, but it's in the, oh, now it's in the correct mode. Thank you, Angie. It's in the correct it mode. Okay, in, perfect. Yes, okay, right. thank you. So, um, I will give you a short presentation about uh, some of the ozone data assimilation activities um, within CUMS. So, I'll give you a brief overview of what CUMS is and does. Then, um, talk about our CUMS reanalysis that we have produced. Showing some examples and also, um, yeah, showing which data sets we used. And then um, present the plans and the time frame for a new reanalysis that we hope to um, complete during the comes to funding phase. And I also have um, a couple of slides on ozone requirements for a future era six reanalysis. Um, could you just mute yourself? Yes, please mute yourself. <laughs> <laughs> So, um, CAMS is the Copernicus Atmosphere Monitoring Service that is um, implemented by ECMWF on the behalf of the European Commission. And we pro provide a range of atmospheric composition products, both um, in near real time. We run a global atmospheric composition model and data assimilation system twice every day to produce five day forecasts. But we also go back in time to produce past data sets in the form of free analyses. And we have um, the key pollutants, for example, CO, NO2, we've got aerosols, we have greenhouse gases, and we also um, focus on ozone. And um, yeah, that's the only data I will focus on in, in this talk. So the data we use in near real time are shown here. This time series going back to 2015 through to now. And you can see we have um, yeah, the Aura instruments, OMI and MLS that have been used throughout. We've got SBUV NOAA 19. We have the three GOM 2 instruments that came in and went out at various times. And we now also use, um, or we have been using TROP OMI since the end of 2018. And we also use um, some of the OMPS data. So it's quite a, a, a bunch of, of data sets that go in there. So as I already said, we run our system um, every day um, to produce five day forecasts. But our system yeah, isn't frozen in time because we yeah, constantly work on it to try to improve it. So we usually have two model updates per year where, for example, the horizontal and the vertical resolution could change. The observation usage might change or the emission data sets might change. That means our model now is very different to the one we had, um, say, 10 years ago. And even it is quite different to the one we had um, about a year ago because we changed the emission data sets we use. So if you want to look back in the past and compare, for example, um, yeah, different years and calculate anomalies or trends, you can't do that with our near real time system. And this is illustrated here on, on the left, which um, shows an ozone score at the Antarctic Neumeyer station. So um, good is here at the top, bad is at the bottom. And you have in black here the score from our near real time system. And you can see how it improves with time. And you can also see that every year during the ozone hole season, we, we really struggled at the beginning. Um, that's why we run reanalysis. Um, or produce reanalysis products. So we freeze our model at a certain time and then go back, in this case, to 2003 to run the whole period with one version of the model. Um, so we don't have any model changes affecting yeah, our, our changes in comparison to other data sets. We also try to use consistent emissions for the whole period and consistent reprocessed observations. So ideally, um, yeah, we want to produce a data set that could be used for trend analysis. And here in red, now you have the same score from the comes reanalysis, and you can see it's a lot higher here in the earlier years. We still have an issue in 2004 
where we didn't have any profile data um, to assimilate during the ozone hole season. So, um, yeah, the COMS reanalysis I already mentioned, we go back to 2003 and currently all the data up to June 2020 are available and new months or years are constantly being added. We hope the rest of 2020 will be released within the next few months. Again, it contains aerosols, chemical pollutants, and we also have a reanalysis for CO2 and methane. And um, all our data is freely available. So you can go to the website here and um, get the data from our atmospheric data store, the, the ADS. We have then used our reanalysis to look, um, for example, at the exceptional Antarctic ozone situation that we had um, last year um, at the Arctic ozone in spring 2020. Um, and this plot shows a time series from 1979 to 2020 of the average March total ozone north of 63 degrees north. And we have various data sets here. Got our comes reanalysis in red. And in blue is the era five reanalysis that's produced by um, C3S, so the Climate Change Service, which uses the same stratospheric chemistry parameterization as we use in COMS, but doesn't have the tropospheric chemistry. But as far as the total columns um, are concerned, these two data sets agree very well. And what we've done is we've used the earlier years from era five, which produces data from 1979 onwards, and augmented them with our COMS reanalysis data to get a longer time series. And um, you see here in the overlap period, um, the red and the blue curves agree very well. They diverge more here towards the end where um, era five started to use um, some different observations compared to COMS. And we also have superimposed here on this plot NASA's merged ozone data set and the multi-sensor reanalysis. So what I want you to take from this plot is that, yeah, there's a lot of variability, as I guess you all know. And also there were three years with exceptionally low ozone values. It was 1997, 2011, and then, yeah, last year, 2020, which now our data set with the lowest on record. So we can use the COMS3 analysis to yeah, investigate this. And we can also look at anomalies um, against our climatology. And this is shown here, our climatology was calculated over the years 2003 to 2019. And here we look at monthly mean ozone um, column anomalies for December, January, February, March, and April. And you can see how much lower, um, for example, here in March, the o total ozone was in 2020 than um, it was in the climatology. And we also have the temperature and wind information to see that it goes with, um, uh, a very cold stratosphere and a very strong and persistent polar vortex. Um, we can also look at the Antarctic ozone hole using our data set, and that is illustrated here in these time series. Here, um, we all the time series start in January, go through the to the end of the year. And again, we have data from COMS, COMS reanalysis and ERA 5. So we have the range in this gray shading the mean in black, and then the red shows 2020 and the um, Suyan 2019. And we look at yeah, various fields. Here's the ozone hole area, and you can see the big difference between the um, long and um, deep Antarctic ozone hole that we had in 2020 and the very unusual and uh, short-lived ozone hole we had in um, 2019. And we can also see here the temperature differences the cold stratosphere in 2020 and the much warmer one with the warming in September uh, in 2019. And then here we have the ozone column minimum values. We see in 2020, we went just below 100 oxygen units in our uh, data set at the beginning of October, whereas in 2019 values were a lot higher. So um, the country analysis can be quite a useful data set set to explore the stratospheric ozone field. So I wanted to um, focus a bit now on the data we use and some of the issues um, that brings in our reanalysis. 
So these, this is a table showing the, yeah, the ozone data we used. So we have gone to from various instruments. We've got MIPAS MLS giving us uh, profile information from the LIMPS founders. We've got OMI, OMPS. We just started to use at the beginning of 21. And then we have Skemaki, SBUV from various instruments and TROPOMI, which in the reanalysis we only just started to assimilate. And um, you can already see here in the period and the version tables that for a lot of the data sets, we changed the versions halfway through um, or at some point because we had to change to near real time data because the reprocessed data uh, were not available anymore for the more recent years. And for example, for the MIPAS data, we used the original ESA near real time data for the first year and a bit because the CCI data only started in 2005 and we thought this would still give us some useful information. And this is just another way of looking at this, um, a time series again, now showing, yeah, which periods we had the, the various data sets for. And you can see the longest really are the, yeah, Aura, OMI and MLS data sets. But even here we have a change to the near real time data at some point in the period. And um, those changes show through, or at least some of them, if we look at comparison against um, ozone sons. This is again um, a comparison against ozone sons at the Neumeyer station, the Antarctic Neumeyer station. And um, we start in 2003, go through to the end of 2020, looking at monthly mean differences in percent. And I've deliberately chosen a color scale that highlights some of the differences. So, um, over large parts of the stratosphere, a lot of the differences are within plus minus 10%. And you can see every year in the ozone hole, you get larger relative differences. So I guess it's more difficult to capture and also the absolute values um, are lower. But in the stratosphere on the whole, it doesn't do too bad a job. You see larger relative differences in, in the troposphere. But then if you look in detail, you see um, yeah, various data events. For example, you see these large differences we have in the first half of 2004. That was after the end of the first MIPAS period and before MLS started. So we didn't have the profile data to correct the ozone here. We also see here at the beginning, um, we have the near real time MIPAS data. We didn't have any MLS and OMI. And then as MLS and OMI begin, we really changed the bias compared to, to the ozone sons um, and now get a yes, slight overestimation, say in the upper troposphere here, whereas before it was negative. Then um, we changed to um, the near real time SPUV data from using a reprocessed version before, and that really affected the tropospheric ozone here at the high latitudes. We also changed the OMI version, and after that we noticed more negative values here, which I'm not sure, but but some of it could also be due to changes in 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 ozone sons. And then further on, there's a change um, from offline to near real time MLS data, which again we can see here. So what I want to um, take from this plot is that for reanalysis products, it's really important to have consistent long term data sets because if we do have to change throughout um, or at some point in the period. Um, this really feeds through in uh, into the data prod or into the reanalysis. So I now want to say talk briefly about our plans for a new comes reanalysis where we hopefully improve on some of the issues that we found in the, the current one. So the current one started into or covers the period from 2003 onwards it's at 80 kilometers, 60 levels in the vertical as a tropospheric chemistry and a linear stratospheric ozone parametrization. For COMS2, we plan to again start in 2003 when all the NVSAT and um, then also the, the Aura data uh, soon become available. But um, we might go for higher resolution definitely in the vertical and perhaps also in the horizontal. And we might, um, if that is advanced enough in our model, include stratospheric chemistry. And the plan is to start this production in 2023. Um, 
there is no funding to have a reanalysis that goes back further within comes to, but we hope to do that um, after the comes to phase. So perhaps starting in 2027, where um, yeah, we would hope to go back to 1979 and produce a longer data set. So this time frame for the reanalysis in um, comes to means that any new data sets we want to use have to be available by mid 2020 at the latest, because we need to test them and um, need, to, need to process them. So the earlier any new products can be available, the better, because um, otherwise we might just not be able to use them if they come too late. Um, the requirements we have is yeah, ideally new, better, reprocessed data sets. We want long time series and consistency and continuity and especially important is the consistency between different instruments um, of the same kind, for example, between GOM2, ABC, or the various SBUV instruments. Also, for we, we found in the past that profile data are very important. So here the MLS and um, the MIPAS data were crucial for us. And then, as I already said yesterday, it would be great if the um, reprocessed version could continue to be provided close to nearer time, perhaps with a month's delay or so, so that we don't have to change to a nearer time product, but could just run a little bit behind to um, use a, um, a reprocessed version. And then, um, yeah, this, this talk is about ozone, but obviously other species um, we need as well, for example, NO2 or CO. Um, and now I just have two short slides on era five and era six. So era five um, also assimilated a lot of ozone data and they also assimilated infrared radiances from various satellites in addition to um, the retrievals. And they went back to 1979. So um, there is already yeah, demand for data for, for the earlier years in C3S. Um, that isn't there in incomes yet. And I asked um, Hans Hersper, who's leading the reanalysis product or yeah, project, um, what their requirements would be. And he said um, they plan to start the next reanalysis era six in 2024. And um, they might run from 1950 onwards, but they would run the period from 1979 first. And they would want any data um, after 1979 by early 2023. So again, they can test the data, they can process the data. For the older data, there is a bit more time. And again, they want new, newly reprocessed data sets. And uh, he said it's very important to have longer and less interrupted time series because they really struggled um, with the early BUV data in the 1970s that they used in the era five back extension, because that was very fragmented and um, led to quite a lot of problems. Yeah, and um, that's already the, the end of my talk. So I just wanted to advertise again that um, the CAMS data are all freely available from our atmosphere data store. And um, yeah, you can find that here on, on the web. And that's, um, yeah, that's it. Thank you, Anchi. You have a bunch of questions. <laughs> Uh, so, uh, yeah, um, uh, okay, oh, maybe stop sharing yeah. and, um, okay. Perhaps if you can check, uh, uh, and find yes. Me. <laughs> yes, it's going to be, uh, be faster. Um, uh, right. and then if anybody of the people who ask the questions want to take the floor, um, some are more technical. So if you could, uh, for example, the first one is about the uh, use of top tropomy for comes reanalysis and which product from the near real time. Um, uh, that was from Diego. Where are we? Uh, uh, in the CAMS reanalysis, we only use um, the ozone data now, and that's the near real time one, yes, because that's the data we have, because we haven't got time to acquire a lot of data as we run along, because we just haven't got the manpower. So we just use, once we've switched to the near real time data, we just, yeah use the near real time data. I have a follow-up uh, question then for the reanalysis. Uh, 
uh, you will need also that, that we reprocess the near real time data then in the future. Um, well, for the next three analysis, we would definitely, if there is a reprocessed drop only version, we would definitely use that. Yes. So that that's coming. So we plan this yeah, year to yeah. reprocess all the data, all the drop. Yeah, and I mean, we would also hope to um, by then be able to use the CO data and the NO two in another reanalysis. Okay, thank you, Antia. So next one, why is it always so high <laughs> in the spring at Neumeyer? Um, yes, that's um, a problem we always have. And um, I think it comes from some of the SBUV data that we assimilate and the vertical correlations of the background errors we use. We've already improved it compared to the previous MUP and comes interim reanalysis, but something is still an issue there. It's also it always looks worse in relative terms because it's so low in the troposphere there that it's very easy to get a large relative error, but it is an issue. Um, why are so many old near real time data sets used in the comes reanalysis? Um, well, we changed to the near real time data once we were running in near real time. So um, they. Yeah, are obviously the ones we acquire. Um, yeah, in near real time, and I think most are the new ones. For some of the um, data sets, we did not have time to acquire new data sets before we had to start because we had uh, a real pressure to start the reanalysis at a certain time. And I don't know if you me mean the. Um, ESA MIPAS data, for example, I think when we started the COMS reanalysis, we couldn't find any reprocessed data prior to 2005. Um, shall I just go through them all, or do you want a discussion with other people as well? <laughs> I'd say, you know, um, maybe there are so many. So if you can just go into the chat and then uh, um, you know, answer. Okay. They have answered the I'm happy to keep going. Well. But if, um, you yeah. want to discuss but something in the else interest as well. of time, yeah, maybe in the interest of time, we'll just now move to the general discussion. Okay. And is that okay. All yeah, right. Thank fine. you, Angie. Thank you so much. Yes. Thank you. Then this is uh, Michiel, and I will take over then for the final discussion on the on the workshop. And we have had very interesting presentations uh, today. Uh, and uh, I just want to, to go back now a bit to the objectives of the, the workshop where we had today the uh, science community presenting how they use the data set. And that is exactly the aim of this workshop to bring together the scientists, both in the generation of the data sets and in the use in the broader ozone community. Uh, and also to collect and to learn about the requirements for, for future data sets and also for possible future missions that we know how the ocean CCI uh, process uh, should uh, proceed. And um, to, to, to start this discussion, we have set up a few questions on the discussion, but please do not feel limited to the questions that are posed on, on the slides. Um, there could be a, 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 a bit wider discussion of topics that need to be addressed uh, with this group that we have now. Uh, but the purpose of the discussion is, of course, uh, that the that the project and ESA is helped in uh, 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 continuation of the ozone CCI products in the right direction. So I want to go through the first slide with the first seed questions. I just read them with you, and then you can start to think of how you could contribute to this uh, after after I have done this. And so the first question is, how could we improve the user uptake of the ozone CCI products that were presented yesterday and where you have seen today how they are taken up so far? So how could we improve upon this? And then also which other ozone CCI data products you are looking for? So we heard already a few comments from different speakers. So which other products? And the third question is, how could the project Ozone CCI interact with a future CCI projects on Ozone precursors from, from the user's point of view? And also with other C CCI uh, uh, 
essential climate variables other than the ozone precursors uh, that could be used in future in combination with stratospheric ozone or with tropospheric ozone. So for the stratosphere, you could think of stratospheric water vapor, but maybe there are also other ECVs that we have not yet thought of that that users would bring up uh, that we should interact as ozone CCI. So I would like to give the floor uh, to someone who could start uh, starting the discussion. So one element maybe to start with is that I think we heard two different applications, both on the forecasting and the neural time need and the long-term monitoring needs. Uh, and I, I also had a feeling that there was some uh, discussion on if it's needed to be a merged data sets or single instrument data sets. And uh, that's, I think, an interesting discussion. Um, hi, it's Irene. I can speak a little bit from the ground-based community, I guess, perspective, at least from my perspective, um, that related to the ground-based community. I, I think this data set um, of, you know, very great value is because they um, allow us to, uh, to, to work with uh, one data set. I don't say that's perfect, you know, it's a, uh, the same thing, you, you assimilate the data and some step changes would be showing up. So it, it, the, this, this presentation, the last presentation was very important for me to see where exactly the step changes occurred. So maybe marking the step changes for us uh, when we're comparing the ground-based observations with um, reanalysis is uh, of a great importance to understand. Um, and uh, what, what we usually do also is that we use the um, reanalysis data, we worked with Chris, you know, using Mira uh, and, um, you know, other data sets um, to, to gain the knowledge about the spatial variability. Um, because when we compare, for example, our seen lows on sod at the South Pole, we also would like to know uh, what's happening, you know, uh, in, the, uh, in the large area across the um, Antarctic continent. So I, th I think that that way it's very uh, useful for us to have either maps or either additional, as you mentioned, additional proxies that um, we can use to understand what's happening with our ground-based observations because, for example, we don't measure CO vertically or um, some um, water vapor is not measured vertically. Um, um, and um, understanding of stratospheric intrusions sometimes is important. Um, you know, there are various applications. I think that it's very important to have all of this information in one kind of place where we can shop for it. Um, over, over past data has been always really great. You know, we want to be work with satellite data. We have uh, station over past data so we can come and pick up uh, something that's very quick. Would you be helped if, if there would be other metrics in the, in, the, in, the, in the products? And I also like what Peter Hoare presented on different metrics, on present the data, on, on other coordinates or or the greetings. Oh, is that the question for me? No, you have to, but also oh. others could react, of course. But uh, oh, just yeah. to, from from the from the ground based, and if you, when you use satellite data or compare satellite data with ground based data. Mm -hmm. Yeah, definitely. For for me, uh, for for the work that we are doing, we are comparing, for example, with Sage say data. There, there is no really close overpass for the ground based station, so we're looking at the PV fields to figure out if we're in the same air mass. So that that's important, and um, also for the um, analysis um, and um, knowing the equivalent latitude information where our station is. Is it you know strat uh, sub subtropical or uh, um, polar regime? That's that's also of great value. So yeah. I think that would be very important, not in a monthly mean averages. I think monthly mean averages would be really difficult to do, but for the daily profiles, I think it would be a um, great value. Okay, I think Martin also. Yeah, your yeah camera. You, maybe you want to react? Yes. Yeah, I, I have a question to Antje because yesterday she asked or she, she had the suggestion or she is looking for other kinds of data products. For example, she was saying that she is also looking for level two uh, data from from different kinds of sources and and so this was was an interesting point for me and and maybe Antje can can uh, say something more about it what she is looking for what what ECMWF is looking for so which kind of data sources you are looking for 
Um, well, we basically look for whatever <laughs> we can find. I mean, we want to use a lot of the data sets because um, often the more we use, um, the better the product, especially if we combine total column data with um, profile data. Mm -hmm. I think that is quite crucial. So if there are um, other data providers that provide, say, better quality products than CCI, and we mm -hmm. test them, then we would use those. Mm -hmm. um, if um, other, for example, if there's, if for era five, I guess they use all the TOMS data in addition to the CCI data because they go back further in time, whereas mm -hmm. we didn't in, in comes. Um, so I guess CCI is, a, is one very good start for a lot of the data products, but if something we want isn't covered, then we would see, yeah. Where but the point yesterday find. you raised was that you are not only looking for level two or level three plus data sets, or we, you're we looking level two. for we can't, because level two, we yes, similarly, a, um, yes. the satellite orbits as they come, so they have to be level two. Okay, yeah, this and, was, um, was my point, yes. Okay. Yeah, and uh, as I said, era five, they also assimilated the infrared radiances, mm -hmm. uh, but in comes we haven't. Whether we will do that in the next reanalysis, we don't know yet. Okay. But it's mainly, yeah, level two products. Yeah, also, I think uh, there was a remark that uh, merged data sets are maybe less uh, needed for uh, for comms, uh, and you prefer to have single instrument records, uh, consistent uh, long-term single instrument uh, I think, combination of instruments. Yeah, yeah, I think that is quite important. I mean, um, it would be nice to, at some point, test these combined Yazi GOM2 products, especially if they have higher resolution in, in the troposphere, if there's more... Um, yeah, degrees of freedom and more information there. But we haven't um, done that at all. So it would definitely need, um, yeah, testing first. Yeah, and did you co consider li like this combined products like uh, OMI MLS for on tropospheric also on? Uh... No, we haven't. Um, again, that might be something worth exploring for, yeah, the next reanalysis. And can, one of can the I, yeah. can I elaborate on this? This is Dan, sorry. I wondered whether the our American colleagues the, in MERA are planning to uh, include uh, profiles from sensors other than MLS in the product. If I don't know if anyone is there, maybe uh, Christoph would know. Yes, I, I can speak to that. Yes, so the next reanalysis will definitely have a um, SMIN profiler um, in it. So that's that's for ozone. So we can't convince you to include the CCI <laughs> limb profiles. Uh, so okay, uh, mm. uh, I've been thinking since yesterday. Actually, uh, one thing is, of course, data latency. Our reanalyses typically run um, not the way we release them, but the way we run them about 10 days uh, after real time. So that's that's kind of a limiting factor there. But you know, you got me thinking. <laughs> I think that's also- we definitely, we definitely want to shoot for something that is trend friend. I'm, so, I'm sorry, uh, aren't you? Um, no, I have to say the latency is, is the same problem. Yes, right, yeah. for, for, you, for you the same problem. Yeah. Uh, we want something that will be tra as trend friendly as possible. And even, you know, looking at MLS and OMS limb profiler on MPP, uh, they, they don't, they have relative biases. Uh, biases exist between them. So we, what we're going to do is, you know, kind of a very tiny little version of what, what, what you people are doing, uh, kind of homogenize those, uh, those two instruments to avoid a discontinuity. Uh, once OMPS OP comes online, uh, it comes into the reanalysis. So merging homogenization like that is definitely something we would like to do, you know, offline prior to assimilating anything. So all, the, all those things are very much on the table. Uh, Victoria is here. Uh, I have uh, actually a question to uh, both you and Ansi. 
Uh, as I mentioned, that uh, the importance of uh, uh, homogenized level to data. What do you think? Would it be advantages to uh, homogenize, uh, for example, MLS, MIPAS, OMPS uh, before assimilation? Would this be improved reanalysis? I, I think it would be great. You know, we, we did some um, preliminary experiments with um, OMPS LIM profiler adjusted to MLS, and, and, and it's very promising. Yeah. Uh. I agree. Uh, I mean, we haven't tested it, but um, it must help. Yeah. We also use um, some of the profile data um, to anchor our bias correction because we bias correct the total column data. Right. Bias correct the profile data. So if we have more consistency in the profile data, I think that would be very good. Exactly. So, so th this is this is my um, concern about adaptive bias correction. Uh, that, you know, it has to be anchored in some place. Yeah. Uh, if, if you don't have a long-term data set that you believe is stable uh, and serves to anchor the, the analysis and bias correction, I think can sometimes do more damage than, than help. Yeah. Is, is, there, is there from the reanalysis point of view uh, uh, go, going back to the slide that we also have on top, uh, any requirement on different components? I heard you, uh, Antje, you said also, on, but also a CO and NO2 from Tropomi. But are there any interdependencies or things that we need to look at, uh, uh, or, or can we just st st stay with ozone and we provide ozone and others provide other components? Uh, and you, uh, from the reanalysis point of view, you do not care too much about interactions. Um, I think from our point of view, if the NO2 is provided by somebody else, um, that doesn't matter to us as long as it's a good product. And it wouldn't just be TROP-OMI, it would also be yeah, all the GOM2 instruments, OMI, Skiamaki, because we use NO2 from all of those. So yeah, it doesn't all have to be produced by the CCI. Um, I just wanted to make the point it's yeah not just ozone that we need, but other data sets as well. So this is an this is an uh, issue that's coming back also yeah, always within ESA and in the discussions in the CMUC and how the different CCI groups should work together and uh, how cross ECV uh, activity should be uh, pursued. But on the other hand, uh, the data production is really specific per ECV and the activities uh, and in ozone CCI focus really on ozone. Mm -hmm. uh, and but then the question is always: uh, Do uh, are users satisfied? with these specialized projects. Yeah, <laughs> it certainly helps, I think, um, the processing and the preparation if a lot of the data sets come in the same formats that um, um, the guys in our forecast department who yeah, process the data and convert them for us to use in the analysis um, don't have to write a new converter for everything, but um, it all fits in nicely. I mean, that's... Um, yeah. Okay. I think uh, we should provide, uh, move on to the second slide with our, uh, uh, some other topics uh, that we uh, uh, prepared uh, for this discussion. And so this is more into the data and the user requirements uh, for the evolution into the next phase of the project uh, and beyond. And one specific thing with the American colleagues online uh, is that would you think that the combined evaluation of the OSON CCI data products with e.g. NASA or other institutions should be organized in, in the future? And on what aspects and what could be a common focus? And I have put a, a few points there, instrumental issues, the analysis of the OSON data products to trigger activities uh, on uh, more work on, on uh, non satellite products, on validation. Uh, uh, should we, we be complementary or mainly coordinate or uh, uh, along uh, common goals or any other aspects? So I think it's interesting to have this discussion here now uh, uh, between um, the people from uh, US and, and Europe together. Maybe this is this is Christian. Maybe before somebody responds from from side of ESA, so the plans are that the current CCI project runs for another year, then um, enters um, phase two, which will be another two years, 
uh, and at that time, um, ESA will redefine the program basically. So the CCI program will go into a, a next a next stage. So there will be there will be some of these points that you actually raised, like cross ECV work and so on. These are things that are being discussed. Um, and beyond that, also if we should be looking into different different ECVs. So so the first question could also be understood if what what needs to be done for the next phase. So these are the next the next year, the next uh, three years with the phase two, and then what is beyond beyond that uh, to be done. So this is Jessica New. I mean, I think to a large degree, number two will be or tropospheric ozone will be accomplished um, through the through the TOR two analysis uh, and and I think that that will also help to define um, further user requirements data and user requirements for um, for the data sets that that you know I'm sure that will identify things that it would be nice to have in order to produce a, an even better sort of intercomparison among among products. So it seems to me that to a large extent, these two issues for tropospheric ozone will be addressed through TOR. Um, but maybe there, there are things that I'm not thinking of. And I, I think that's, that's very good that you mentioned this because I think there are a few activities that have been mentioned today. And one of them is of course also the other the SPARC activities uh, uh, like um, OCTAF UTLS. So there are indeed different frameworks already uh, where this co cooperation is taking place. Maybe other issues people might think is uh, interesting. Also what they have heard in the last two days, what they think is uh, very important to, uh, to address uh, together. Um, uh, you say in uh, trigger activities uh, on more work on non-satellite products. Um, can you say what you mean in that? Yeah, there are, yeah, so I can say that I, I think about uh, uh, validation activities and the, 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 the use of the of the networks, but maybe others can comment. Martin, could you add to that uh, what other aspects uh, we had in mind here? Yeah, no, I have no no specific things in mind, but nevertheless, as the point of evaluation, this is the point. So, when we are making that, let's say, looking at quick looks of 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 the NASA, NASA products in comparison with the ESA products, so there are some obvious differences. And uh, to go along these lines, this this would be something which I'm interested in to to see, or to 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 investigate the differences. What could be the reason? Uh, has it something to do with the data quality or is it something wrong with the retrieval algorithms or something going wrong in this year or whatever? So there are some, let's say, differences between the, the long term data sets. And, and so this is my point to, to bring things together and to make a join or let's say a common common activity to where we can can check uh, the, the quality of the data products with each other and and uh, try to find out what are the, the reasons for the differences. This is this is a very simple thing. Um, that means that you will be producing the overpass data for the ground over ground base stations if you're going to use the ground base stations. Or I don't know that there are some aircraft data that is also in other opportunity, I guess, to, to look into. Um, so, I I mean, the, the, the data, the ground-based data already been archived, right? So, what, what else would you like for us to provide if you're going to use the ground-based data? If there is something in addition to what is currently archived on WDC and DEC and other uh, shadows, etc. Yeah, one, one possibility, for example, is uh, to use uh, the Caribbean data from from the aircraft measurements in the UTLS region. So this is an additional set of data which which is 
uh, I think organized uh, currently or, or coordinated in, at, at KIT, the Karlsruhe Institute of, of Technology. So there are data from from regular flights, from from aircrafts, from yeah, which are regular flights in the UTLS region, and there are a lot of data sets available. And and for example, this would be an exercise for an let's say a an evaluation exercise with respect to the UTLS. So use these these. Uh, um, these many uh, uh, aircraft measurements in comparison with, for example, with with the uh, yeah, other data from from satellites, for example. So, in particular, in the region of the UTLS. Yeah, maybe, maybe another point what you could think of is that we get uh, in the uh, coming years the, the geostationary platforms and we have Tempo, we have uh, Sentinel-4 in Europe, we have the GEMS in Korea and they will also provide mid-latitude ozone uh, data uh, and I think uh, it makes sense to, to, to work together on these, on these projects and uh, uh, the question will be uh, also for, for, for us in Europe, how we uh, will take the Sentinel-4 data on board in this project. So I don't know if there are already activities on, on Tempo Ozone. I don't know if um, somebody can speak to the tempo. The only thing I know that there is a large community of um, um, already following tempo and preparing to to do analysis or ingest the data. And they've done a lot of um, exercises, you know, basically to producing the fake, fake. Well, fake is not a good word. <laughs> Some look alike uh, tempo data uh, for people to use and uh, and see how that they gonna be. Uh, implemented, I'm sure that there, this data will be implemented heavily into their quality analysis. Um, and, um, yeah. Irina, this is Emma Nolan from NASA GMAO. I think we prefer the word synthetic data. <laughs> when, oh, thank you so much. That's, that's my Russian speaking. <laughs> <laughs> synthetic data, thank you. <laughs> um, I. I, I guess one thing is that we at GMAO we are working towards um, using the our latest composition forecast system uh, to be the a priori for the the tempo retrieval. So that's kind of um, something that we're in the works right now and discussing with the tempo science team. I don't think that this this new real time system has been really talked about much um, in the workshop over the last couple of days. Um, it's similar to um, something like Mira two or our Geos FP system, but we run a coupled system with Geos Chem Chemistry, um, and we do use uh, satellite constraints on our stratosphere go zone. I think one of the big things will be, of course, you have this uh, high temporal resolution over mid latitudes uh, and being able to look at certain processes in the, uh, around the tropopause or so. Uh, much uh, uh, more uh, temporal frequency. So I don't know how important it could be for comparisons and for, for validation again, that you have this uh, high temporal resolution and how that could be uh, exploited maybe uh, for, for different activities. I, I just want to add to this point um, also to Martin Damaris that it's not only Caribic which has flights just once a month, you have also Jagos Core and that's flying in the UTLS five times a day. You have ozone data with high resolution and I think that's a very good statistic to bridge the gap between um, kernels and satellites and um, the high resolution, exactly what you pointed out now. So I think maybe that's the point to come together yeah. there. Peter, you're totally right. This was only one example I was mentioned. Yeah. Yeah. But but this is this is uh, I think this is a, a, would be a big a big yeah I would say a big advantage to use these these uh, uh, aircraft data, so aircraft based data sets. 
So there's a large amount of data available, in particular in the UTLS. And as I've heard from from Hellas talks, it's uh, in particular in, in at mid latitude UTLS regions there are some uncertainties, and therefore we can use these as the uh, aircraft data. I would like to proceed to the last slides with the last uh, questions and just see if there are a few other things coming up uh, after this. Uh, so the last ones are so what. Ozone CCI should provide for future assessment reports. We have heard already a few elements of this of a reanalysis. We also got some time constraints from the reanalysis projects and assimilation. Uh, and what are the wishes and the needs of the Ozone CCI group itself towards the ground based and balloon networks? Uh, if there are still issues to be mentioned from ourselves, so uh, this is also an opportunity. And then the third one what could be done on Ozone with the upcoming missions that I started just on these geostationary ones so uh, but also if you have other points please raise that now i'm i'm just gonna this is wolfgang uh, i'm just gonna say that that overall um i think we're very happy with what ozone cci has been doing and what has been providing because uh, without that we probably wouldn't have it and Things got a little bit easier now with less satellites up there, but uh, after Envisat, there was just a zoo of of uh, ozone data, ozone profile data, and different uh, retrievals, and and ozone CCI has really pulled a lot of that together, yeah. and and is kind of a one one stop shop uh, for people that need. Um, usable, uh, comprehensive data. So, so big applause on that. I would say. Yeah, thank you for this, uh, Wolfgang. But, but the, the the reason why we asking these all these questions is because we would like to be better in future, and and how how can how could we be better in future, and therefore this question. So, what what the community is looking for in particular. With respect to the reanalysis, the assimilation systems, and so on, and also with respect to the assessments. So, what can we do? What can we provide? And how can we uh, provide better better products in 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 the next future? This this is uh, the reason for asking these questions because we know that ESA is interested in that we are continuing with our activities, and the question is where should we focus on? Well, I, I, a first step would be to stay good and up to date. Okay. Yes, I, I would agree with that and add that, you know, whether reanalyses would directly assimilate the CCI, CCI product or, or not, it would still serve as a validation product. Uh, even if there are um, some of the same instruments that are used in the reanalyses are also used in those data sets, they are processed differently. So there, there is great value in that. Mm -hmm. We always look for a good independent or semi-independent validation data. Um, also from, uh, from things like um, ozone sounds and ground-based observations, which are typically not assimilated, so they are really independent. Yes, so it, it could also imply that we need an other strategy for some, some data sets uh, and uh, to think of them more as valid, potential validation data sets, and mm -hmm. while other data sets are more near real time processing data sets, and we could think of that a bit more beforehand, uh, maybe. I also have to remind you about the, um, some discrepancies we found um, in Lotus One activity between the um, trans drive from some ground based and satellite systems. So I think it would be good to to move together to try to figure out if it's a sampling, if it's a instrumental issues, if it's um, something else. So I, th I think that that's really good point. And ha having this greedy data sets definitely is a way forward. And also the, the, the fact that you're trying to construct the um, not just the LIM profiler uh, combined data sets, but also the uh, backscatter data. I think it's also very important because we've seen some differences between the 
various um, satellites and during the activity when you're trying to put them together, this is definitely where you're addressing some differences and um, I think it's useful. That's a good point. Thank you. Paul, is this a question to, to, the, to, the, to the discussion now about uh, water vapor and stratospheric aerosols? Or is it something? Yeah, I just commenting back on it was on the previous discussion sheet that I ah, I was okay. okay I was I was chatting you. on other topics. Sorry, I was off, okay. off topic. Yeah, yeah okay, okay. Um, yeah, we, but uh, because this you know, was you a... think about yeah for the stratosphere in general. I mean, you want to understand um, ozone core. So what Wolfgang just said, you know, keep on keeping on. Um, but also water and aerosols are really pretty fundamental. Um, you, know, you can go on to other important variables in the stratosphere, some sort of chlorine variable, but but water and and aerosols, I think, are both um, difficult things to understand and sort of a, a parameters for that we need for the future. Yeah. But this is a good point because we have uh, these two uh, ECVs uh, based on, on the CCI activities. Uh, about water vapor and also of stratospheric aerosols. So there are some some uh, CCI activities uh, in this in the frame of of ESA. Yes, and this is what we are, where we are thinking about to to come together in particular with with the CCI as a water vapor CCI and also the aerosol CCI, and this could be a, one of the next steps. Yeah, I mean, I mean, both are really important for for atmospheric for stratospheric transport and chemistry. So, yeah, there's a multi-dimensional aspect to these two, as well as their climate forcing. You know, water uh, providing a a um, you know positive feedback if the tropical tropopause gets warmer, you get more water in the stratosphere, mm -hmm. um, which which exacerbates uh, climate change. Same thing with aerosols and in, in aerosol. Uh, Evolution and chemistry in the stratosphere is is, you know, I would say, uh, I, I would say we we basically or, or we have a, a kind of a basic understanding of, of stratospheric aerosols, um, but I wouldn't say that we have, uh, you know, we've talked a little bit on the chat here about stratospheric chemistry and our our knowledge of it, but I I think aerosols fall well below what we know about stratospheric chemistry. So yeah. just understanding the long-term behavior of it surely gives us better science. Yeah, yeah. Regarding stratospheric aerosols, so from the side of ESA, this is also something that um, the aerosol CCI still needs to be more engaged. Um, ESA runs different projects on stratospheric aerosols, but um, yeah, that needs to be looked at more in depth. I, I'd like to elaborate on a bit more technical uh, issue then. If people are using these uh, cross ECV products, what are the typical limitations in using, uh, for instance, CCI products on one vertical grid for ozone and another uh, vertical grid or coordinate for water vapor and another one for aerosol? Is, are we then risking losing the user to an MLS product, which is on the same grid, same units, so very nice and easy to use? So how important is it to, to, to streamline these uh, CCI products so they are really used um, by the community? Good point. I have no answer. <laughs> yeah. But this is something we have to we have to strongly to think about. Yes, so currently I cannot answer your question, but you are right. This is this could be a problem. Yeah. So I don't know if there are some people that like to raise a point that we have not yet addressed in our discussion or, or come back to a question that they had before and for which was no time. Of course, we are now over the proposed end time of the workshop. So maybe if there's not any more points left, then uh, we should 
end the discussions here and maybe say a few words to close the workshop, Martin. Yeah. Yeah, thank you, Michel. Yeah, thank you. Thank you all for being with us. It was a great time today and yesterday. So thank you all for this nice workshop. And in particular, a big thank you goes to the speakers of today and yesterday. So thank you very much because we got very nice talks by you, by all of you. Um, and my point is here, a specific thank you goes to Natalie. Natalie Kalb, she was organizing everything from the back or in the back in an excellent manner. And thank you very much, Natalie, for helping us. This was really helpful for us for, for this organizing this workshop. Thank you, Natalie. Yeah, I think um, in the last two days we got excellent overviews and, and uh, the related uh, ESA ozone CCI activities. And we saw many exciting and stimulating studies using the different ozone data products. And uh, what we have seen is that there's a large potential for, for ongoing work in the next years. Uh, so the discussion yesterday and today, from my point of view, strongly indicate uh, several possibilities for future action, for future activities. For instance, a continuation of the CCI activities, as mentioned a few minutes ago, but also uh, it points out the, the further and more intensive collaborations which are possible. And from my point of view, there is a big potential for collaboration between the different groups, the scientists and also the data product producers. So among other things for me, this workshop can be seen as a, as a starting point for future collaborative research. Uh, both in the field of technical issues and, and science. And I'm very much looking forward for, for the next steps of, of ESAR with respect to CCI, but also with respect to possible collaborations with all of you which have joined the workshop. So thank you all for being with us. Um, and now I would like to, to hand over to, to Michel, Michel van Rosendahl, who would like also to say something last for the, for the workshop. Thank you all. Thank you, Martin. Uh, <clears throat> I just would like to uh, to join you and, and uh, first in saying that uh, I enjoy uh, uh, today's and yesterday's sessions uh, very much. Uh, I fully agree on, on the fact that uh, there was a lot of, uh, in, of information shared, a lot of, uh, of feedback, and uh, I think this is very, this will be very useful for, for us in the future. And of course, I, I, I also want to, uh, want to uh, thank Everybody, uh, the organizing team, you, Martin, Michiel, who did a lot uh, uh, to uh, to prepare this uh, this workshop, uh, the interaction with Christian, uh, who was always there, and of course Natalie, uh, like you said, uh, who was very important for the for the management. And I also want to uh, uh, to thank the discussion leaders. I already mentioned Jean Christopher and Victoria uh, for uh, yesterday's session, but also uh, Martin and Michiel uh, for for today. And finally, all the presenters and uh, the session chairs, and of course the the audience for uh, for their active participation. So uh, I, I think this was mentioned already, but uh, but uh, I just would like to to mention again that this year uh, we will have to to define the content of the next phase of the C3S activities, and next year the content of the second phase of the CCI plus uh, uh, activities. And uh, it's clear that the feedback that we received uh, from you. Uh, will definitely be digested, digested and used to streamline our activities and to try to better serve the community. Uh, and there are a few uh, ideas uh, that we, we can uh, take up uh, uh, and it's clear that we will try to strive, at least we will strive to, uh, to continue to, to provide uh, good uh, ozone data easily accessible to all uh, and really matching what, uh, what you are expecting from us. And the last thing I want to say is that we plan to write down uh, a summary of this uh, workshop uh, where there will be, of course, some highlights on the main outcome. And uh, this is going to appear uh, as an article uh, in, this, in the Spark News newsletter. And it will, of, of course, also be uh, accessible on, uh, uh, on the Ozone CCI uh, website. So with this, thank you again to all of you. And maybe I, I want to uh, uh, give the floor to uh, Christian for the last words. Uh, if he agrees to do it. Yes, uh, thank you, uh, Michel, and thank you, Martin, also for your nice words. I would, I would um, like to 
say that I gave two days very much. So uh, from side of the European Space Agency, Ozone CCI, of course, is a is a very important project and also a very visible project inter internationally, as I have also understood from the from the various presentations. So I would like to thank uh, the speakers, everybody that uh, that accepted the invitation to that. Also, everybody from the Ozone CCI that have presented specifically the organizing committee. We already heard Natalie has done a great job, but also everybody else from the organizing committee. Um, from uh, my side, I've taken some very, very interesting points that have been raised in discussions like new merge products, MLS and ARMS being picked up, how being picked up by models, also cross ECV work. There's also some lessons to be learned from ESA, how we, how we would carry on with this. Um, I appreciate the comments on the on people being happy with what the CCI, uh, the Ozone CCI project has delivered so far. So a great thanks to uh, to the CCI project. I think that that's been a tremendous job. It's been done over over the last couple of years. Um, I actually only came um, in 2018 to the project. So um, my colleague Klaus Zehner, who was uh, responsible for the project previously, has also done a great job on this. So. In this sense, it's kind of a joint, joint effort. Yeah, but uh, and also that that one comment on the on the independent validation data. So CCI has been used as independent validation data. Also was was very very relevant. Yeah. So thanks again to everyone. Looking forward uh, to wrapping up um, that that meeting. And yeah, um, have have a nice remainder of the day. Nice evening. Thank you. Thank you. Bye. Thank you. Bye. Thank you. Thanks, Bye. guys. Thank you. Take care and stay you. safe Thank and healthy. Thank you. Bye. Thank you. Thank you. Bye. 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 Bye.